Mexico City. Even today, the image of the Lady of Guadalupe surprises the world with its enigmas. It appeared mysteriously on the cloak of a Chichimeca Amera Indian and is affectionately known as the Morenita because its features appear to be half cast. For about 500 years, Guadalupe has been a symbol for believers of Latin America. Religious tradition tells that 10 years after the conquest of the Aztec capital, later known as Mexico City, at dawn on December the 9th, 1531, the Amer Indian Juan Diego was traveling to Tlateloco. As he traveled across Mount Tepeyac, he was attracted by the harmonious song of birds from the peak where the sun was rising. He moved towards the peak of the hill. He heard a voice quietly calling him and saw a girl standing in a bright light. She spoke to him in the cultured language of the Aztecs, Nahuatl. Juan Sin, Juan Diego Sin, please, I beg you, I am the Virgin Mary, the mother of the true God for whom all live, the creator of men, Lord of the heavens and the earth. Go to the bishop, tell him that I want a little house here in the glade to honor him who is love, tenderness, compassion, good, peace, truth, justice. Juan Diego raced to the bishop, but obviously it was not easy for him to obtain an audience. Finally, he was received, but the bishop did not believe him and said, I will listen to you later when I have time. So, Juan Diego, disappointed, returned to the mountain. That same day, he climbed Mount Tepeyaca once again and once again met Mary. Juan Diego humbly asked whether it would be better to send someone more important than himself. But Mary answered, Tomorrow, return to the bishop and tell him that I want my little sacred house, my little temple. The next day, Sunday afternoon, Juan Diego returned to the bishop who did not believe him and said, bring me proof, a sign, so that I can believe that it is truly the Lady of Heaven who sends you. Juan de Sumaraga, this was the name of the first bishop of the city of Mexico, ordered some monks to follow the Amerindian. The monks followed him for some time along the path through the woods, but they could not keep up with him. And finally, inevitably, they lost sight of him. Once on the peak of Mount Tepeyac, Juan Diego met Mary once again. When she heard from the poor man that the bishop wanted proof, Mary asked Juan Diego to return the next morning when she would give him a sign to show to Sumaraga. However, Juan Diego did not return the next day. In fact, he had to go and look for a priest, fearing for his uncle, who was seriously ill. He had promised himself that he would see the lady the following day, but to his great surprise, she met him anyway. Juan Sin, Juan Diego Sin, what concerns you? What are you worried about? What is happening? After listening to Juan Diego's explanation, Mary said, Don't worry. Your uncle has already recovered. 
Am I, your mother, not here? Now listen, go to the place where we first met, where we have met before. There you will find some flowers. Pick them and bring them to me. Juan Diego immediately went to fetch the flowers, wrapped them in his cloak and took them to the lady. who, when she saw them, touched them and arranged them and said, go to the bishop and give these flowers only to him and say that this is the sign that the Lady of Heaven has sent to him. It was late on the morning of December the 12th when Juan Diego ran back to the bishop to take him those wonderful Castilian roses, which had never grown on Mount Tepeyac, especially in midwinter. When he reached Sumarica's palace, the Amerindian had to wait a long time before he was received. When he stood before the bishop, Juan Diego told him of his conversation with Mary and opened his cloak to show the flowers. At that very instant, on the poor material of the cloak, an image of Mary appeared. The bishop and all those present fell to their knees before the miracle. Juan Diego, having fulfilled his task, returned to the uncle he had left the day before. His uncle told him that the Virgin had appeared at his bedside, introducing herself with the name Guadalupe. The story of Juan Diego and the Virgin of Guadalupe soon spread by word of mouth, as in the Aztec tradition. There are numerous written sources and local writings that mention this event. It has therefore been possible to verify that the people in this story truly existed. Amongst the local sources closest to the time of the events, there is one that is considered a masterpiece. Its name means, here it is told. It is the faithful and historical document of the apparitions of Our Lady, written just 20 years after the apparitions of Our Lady. It is beautiful from the historical, poetic and literary point of view. The most important document is the Nikan Mopowa. Undoubtedly, it is one of the most important and ancient. The oldest copy, which is held in the New York Public Archives in the Lennox Collection, was written by Antonio Valeriano, an educated Amerindian who studied both Spanish and Latin with the Franciscans, so that he wrote with Latin characters, but with Nahuati sounds. This and other sources, such as the Code 1548, also known as the Codice Escalada, dating from the year of Juan Diego's death, have been carefully analyzed by the Church. In 1990, Pope John Paul II beatified the Amerindian. Saint Juan Diego thus became the first lay Amerindian to be canonized in the history of Christianity. Juan Diego's tilma, on which the image of the Morenita appeared, was a poor cloak, also known as an ayate, used by the poorest Amerindians. They were very long woven cloths that the Amerindians wrapped themselves in. At times they slept on the ground and covered themselves in the cloth, or they used them to carry goods. 
They wrapped the things they bought at the market in them. They were rough cloths with many uses. This cloth was woven on a belt loom about 50 to 55 centimeters wide. San Diego's ayate was formed of three pieces and the image formed on two pieces. So we can see the joint between the two cloths and the seam that runs vertically through the image. In 1946, the Institute of Biology at the Autonomous National University of Mexico studied the cloak, confirming that it was made from agave fibers. The ayate was certainly not the typical canvas used for paintings. Miguel Cabrera, an 18th century artist, stated that it was absurd to think that an artist would have used such a rough canvas made up of two pieces. When various canvases were joined for a painting, the seam was hidden. It was unthinkable that the painter should leave a visible seam. So, how could an agave canvas, which is very fragile, be preserved for such a long time? It is necessary to treat it continually, to fight the parasites that attack it. That is to say, for example, unlike a linen cloth, which is very durable, agave fibers only last for a very short time. This topic has been a surprise for many investigators. Since the fabric has been conserved for more than 475 years, unlike other fabrics made of material very similar to that of the ayate, which have not lasted for more than 10 years. For instance, a painting by Rafael Gutierrez, dating from the late 18th century, located in the Chiesa del Pochito, very close to the ancient basilica, did not last more than 10 years. After eight years, all the colors used had changed, the fabric had deteriorated badly, the fibers had broken, despite the fact that it had been protected with glass from the very start. The entire setting in which the ayate was kept encouraged decay and deterioration of the fabric, since the environment was quite damp and full of saltpeter. Saltpeter attacks stone and crumbles it. The original image remained almost 120 years without the protection of glass. It is therefore a surprise that this fabric, so fragile, should have been preserved. Special measures to protect it have only been taken in recent years. Recently, studies have been carried out that show that the fabric is still not decaying. Moreover, it must be said that the tilma has survived an incident in which nitric acid was poured onto the fabric, an event that caused the appearance of a spot which is inexplicably disappearing. There is more. A bomb that exploded in 1921 during an attack destroyed everything, even bending a massive bronze crucifix, while the image was the only thing that remained intact. Also, the way in which the image is fixed onto the fabric is still a mystery. In the tilma, there is no what we call imprimatur, which is the preparation that painters have to carry out to eliminate the irregularities in the fabric, to fill in the interstices and create a suitable surface so that the paint will stick, so that it will fix. In the case of the tilma, already in 1666 there was proof that this preparation did not exist. The weave of the tilma is so open that you can see through it. Even the brilliance of the colors of the image of Guadalupe does not seem to have dimmed with time. We have descriptions of what it looked like throughout history, and the colors are still the same. There are paintings that preserve their colors because they have a base of paint a final varnish that preserves the colors. But even so, the varnish that was applied oxidizes with time. In painting, to create the sense of volume and depth, layers of color are used, various brush strokes of different hues. 
In the image of the Virgin of Guadeloupe, the Ayate seems to have the volume created from a single brush stroke, a single layer of color. What is more, there is a very surprising fact. It is a very rough canvas because we can see knots and areas with thick weave. In the lips of the Virgin, it is precisely the thick weave that gives this impression of volume. That is, the imperfections in the fabric have been used to create this face. You can see images of Guadeloupe all over the world and copies by various painters, and no one has been able to copy the face. In the 1980s, with infrared photography, a technique that is still used, for example, in the critical studies of ancient paintings, Professors Jody Smith and Philip Callahan, who work at NASA, confirmed that the tilma had not been prepared for painting. They also said that there was a total absence of brush strokes. No strokes, no technique of known painters. What is more? Dr. Callahan concluded, following his studies, that it was not possible to determine the type of pigment. In fact, he was surprised that the pigment had been preserved for such a long time. He was also surprised by the fact that the tilma did not show any damage caused by the smoke and the light of the candles that were used. Callahan's discovery confirmed the results of previous chemical analysis of the tilma. In particular, through a study carried out in 1936 by Dr. Richard Kuhn, a yellow fiber and a red fiber of the ayate were analyzed. Kuhn could not determine whether the pigments were of vegetable, mineral or animal origin. Nor has it been possible to explain the preservation of the pigments, which after such a long time appear so natural. This is not true of many copies. Dr. Kuhn was an expert in his field. He received a Nobel Prize for chemistry, and he understood the chemical composition of acids, pigments, tinctures, and bases. Smith and Callahan stated, however, that parts of the image could have been added at a later date, such as the rays of the sun, the stars on the cloak, and the moon under the Virgin's feet. But in that case, how can we explain that all the copies of the painting, even very close to the time it was created, show all the elements of the original image? One of the most ancient copies, certainly realized prior to 1571, is held in Italy, in the province of Genoa. This image came to Italy through Philip II, King of Spain, who received it as a gift from the second bishop of the city of Mexico. Philip II in turn gave it to an admiral of his fleet, who was Genovese Andrea Doria. Tradition says that Andrea Doria carried this image with him, hanging it in the principal galleon of the Catholic fleet of the waters of Lepanto, where Christianity conquered the Turks. In the 70s, Father Mario Rojas, an expert in the Aztec population, showed that the image of Guadalupe is a true Mesoamerican code full of symbols from the Nahuatl culture. Everything that we find in the image of Our Lady has a meaning. The colors of her garments represent regality, the blue turquoise color or the jade, which was much more valuable than gold. The pinky color of the gown symbolizes the aurora, meaning that the Virgin, with her apparition, announces the birth of the Son, of God. Also, in the color of the aurora, she carries the cerro flowers. There are three types of flower. In the Mexico signs, the most important is the Naui Olin flower. It has four petals with a center. The four petals represent the cardinal points, that is the eternal movement of God, the center of the cosmos. 
This, for the Mexicas, meant that it was the most important thing that she had, as if she was saying, I am carrying the God child, the Son child, so that he can be born here with you, so that you can know him. And they understood this perfectly with the Naui Olin flower. Even the shape of the flowers on the Virgin's garments has a precise meaning. The Cerro flowers are called this because they have the shape of the mountains. This is how the mountains were shown on the maps, what they look like with little pointed peaks. And with this, she wanted to say Tepe Yacatl, peak of the mountain, or pointed mountain. Father Chavez exalts the most important meaning of these flowers that all the native people called Floricanto. The sign for the bishop was the flowers. In a land like the Tepeyac, arid, dusty, salnitrous, where there was no life and yet flowers bloomed, while for the native peoples, Floricanto meant truth. The sign, therefore, was much more potent, much stronger for the native mentality than for the Spanish. They said, I can't see the root, but I understand that there is life in the root. So, the sign that the Virgin was sending to the bishop was the sign of truth. The Amerindians understood all this because it was part of their life, their culture. They understood perfectly that not only was that figure noble, but also that she was an empress, because only the emperor, Moctezum, could use the azure cloak, which meant the sky dotted with emeralds. That is, it became a turquoise color. It also meant that she was a mother, because she was pregnant with the omnipotent God, since the four-petaled flower was present. That she was a virgin, like a maiden, because of the loose hair combed down, which meant virginity. So the Amerindians saw in the hair virginity, and in the belt, maternity. In fact, in the Aztec culture, when a woman was pregnant, she wore a dark purple ribbon around her waist. A mystery also lies in the stars on the cloak. Dr. Juan Homero Hernandez Yescas carried out a specific study in cooperation with two doctors in astrophysics, Canto Io and Armando Garcia de Leon of the Autonomous National University of Mexico. The researchers began by calculating the date and the position of the stars corresponding to the winter solstice of 1531. In fact, they knew that for the Aztecs, the winter solstice meant the birth of the new sun, the light that rediscovers strength and vigor, and it was therefore a very important moment of the year. The scholars discovered that in 1531, the solstice occurred precisely on December the 12th, the day of the miracle of Juan Diego's tilma. It is interesting to note that the winter solstice should have taken place on the 22nd instead of on the 12th. The astronomers of the Mexico Observatory have said that the solstice occurred on the 12th because we had not yet changed from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian. This occurred 50 years later. As the Nikan Mopoa tells, the miracle took place in the late morning. We must remember that at this time we cannot see the stars, so what we do is simply reconstruct the position of the stars in a planetarium. In observing the constellations that could be seen at that time in the territory of the Mexico Valley, Dr. Hernandez discovered something surprising. The sky coincided with the stars present on the cloak of the Virgin. On the left-hand side of the cloak, we see the southern constellations, four stars that are part of the Ofuco constellation. Below, we can see Libra, and on the right is one of the stars of the Scorpion. At the height of the arm, we can see two stars of the Lupus constellation and the tip of Hydra. Lower down is the slightly inclined quadrant of the Sagittarius constellation, and we can perfectly see the Southern Cross. In the lower part, solitary, shines Sirio. On the right-hand side of the cloak, we can see the northern constellations. On Mary's shoulder, a fragment of the constellation of Borte. Then, moving downwards, there is a perfect representation of the Great Bear constellation, surrounded top right by the Chioma Berenice, 
and below by the Canis Venetici. On the left, Thuban, the brightest star of the dragon constellation. Below, two stars that form part of the Great Bear, and at the bottom, three stars from Taurus. There are some difficulties, because as you know, the sky is concave, and, and when it is flattened out, it takes on another shape. Initially, attempts were made to represent the stars as we see them from the Earth, but that doesn't work. In fact, it is as if it were a mirror. The stars on the Virgin's cloak exactly reproduce the position of the constellations at the time of the apparition, but looking at them from space and not from Earth. Even the moon present in the image corresponds to its astronomical position in the sky on December the 12th, 1531. When Our Lady appeared in the winter solstice, the moon was in its first quarter. This is also stated by Gutierre Tibon, explaining that Mexico means navel of the moon. The image of Our Lady herself is a code. Code is a book in which there are no letters, but only drawings, each with its own meaning. If the gown is the plan of the earth, then the stars on the blue cloak are the plan of the heavens. The cultures that developed in Mesoamerica were closely linked to the observation of the sky, observation of the stars. In fact, they even determined the synodal cycle of Venus, Mars and Jupiter and they managed to observe the movements of the heavenly vaults. The people were permeated by all this astronomic activity. This made it possible, for example, to set the dates of religious festivities or civil activities, and obviously the sowing and harvesting of crops. They determined the astronomical cycles of the conjunction of the planets. They constructed a calendar that can be seen as a lunar solar calendar. That is, it was related to the cycle of the sun, of the moon, and with the cycle of Venus. The year 1531 must have been a very special year in the complex Aztec cosmogony. In fact, the winter solstice was registered under the conjunction of the sun and Venus an astronomic event registered every 104 years of extraordinary importance for the Aztecs since it meant the start of a new era. So the Aztecs had already foreseen that a new era would start in that particular year. The stone calendar, the solar calendar, the Aztec calendar shows that a new era begins in the 13th house Kanya corresponding to 1531. In 1521 there was the conquest of Mexico. It was a terrible, horrendous time for the native people. Not only because they had been overcome in war, but also because they already knew, according to their religious concepts, that the fifth sun, that is to say the sun, the historical period, the era in which they lived, was coming to an end. Both in the image of the Virgin and in the story of the apparitions, we find various references to the best-loved divinity of the Aztecs, the goddess Tonantzin, whose festivity was associated with the winter solstice. Tonantzin, the mother of all the gods, was a goddess whose temple stood on the slopes of Tepeyac. It even seems that the Amerindians initially called Guadalupe by the name of this goddess, almost recognizing the same divinity in her. They gave her a native name, Tonantzin Guadalupe. Tonantzin is not a name, but a title, our little mother in a reverential form. So, who can have painted this image, which represents a perfect synthesis between the Christian iconography and the Mesoamerican culture? Who, just 10 years after the conquest of Mexico, could have such a profound understanding of the two worlds? Moreover, who could have translated this knowledge into a masterpiece of harmony, such as the image of Guadalupe? The studies of the image of the Morenita have shown that the painting respects what is known as the golden section. 
a harmonic correspondence between the individual parts and the whole, between the spaces and the volumes, well known to the Greeks, and which can be translated into the golden ratio, 1 to 6.18, present in nature, in man, in the galaxies, and even in music. Initially, my husband took as a reference point the seam down the middle. Beginning from this, he found a perfect square, and from here, using a compass, he found another smaller part, which is a rectangle. The total, A plus B, that is the square plus the rectangle, gives us the golden or perfect ratio. In 2008, a mathematician called Fernando Ojeda Ianis, beginning from Pythagoras' studies of mathematics and music, made a sensational discovery. Using the golden rectangle of the image as a starting point, the mathematician obtained a pentagram, realizing that the symbols of the gown and the stars of the cloak fitted perfectly, like pauses and musical notes. The result was the discovery of a genuine melody in the figure of the Virgin of Guadalupe. But the wonders that surround Guadalupe do not end here. The Peruvian engineer Jose Aste Tosman, taking up studies carried out in the 60s, according to which there are human figures reflected in the eyes of the Virgin, made an exceptional discovery. To carry out this study, I used the technology used in the center where I work, which is known as digital image process. It is the same technology that the NASA uses to study the images sent from space. And many institutions use it to study, for example, microscopic images. At the time, we were working on the satellite images of Mexico. For most of the images, I used little squares of pixels, picture elements of 25 by 25 micron, or thousandths of a millimeter, which give 1,600 dots per square millimeter. Las ampliaciones the images were enlarged 2,000 times to obtain very specific details. Following a chronological order, the first figure that I found and that attracted my attention was that of a native man sitting with his legs crossed as the Mexicas used to do at the time. It is very detailed. The seated native wears a ring in his ear. The thickness is as fine as a hair. The professor also identified what is said to be the figure of the bishop and which corresponds perfectly to paintings from the period in which Juan de Sumaraga is portrayed. Then there is the figure of Juan Diego with a tilma around his neck. Then I found something that really attracted my attention. It was a black woman who I later found out actually existed in history. Then, near what was supposed to be the bishop, I saw a white man. I later came to know that he could have been an interpreter. We know that Sumaraga needed an interpreter when he spoke to the natives. We know his name. He was called Juan Gonzalez. The last figures discovered by Tonsman belong to a family group. Mother, father, two children and another pair of adults, where the woman is carrying a child on her back. 
Altogether, there are 13 human figures to be seen in the eyes of Guadeloupe. According to the laws known as Purkinje Sampson, from the name of the scientists who discovered them, when our eyes reflect something, up to three images of the same object can form. When we look at something, our corneas behave like two mirrors. They are two crystals that reflect what is in front of us. There is not the same image, the same dimensions in both eyes, because they are separate. In fact, that is why we can see in three dimensions. In the eyes of the Virgin, there are 13 joint images, but they are grouped in two scenes. One of the questions people often ask is, if the Virgin was in the Tilma, how can she see Juan Diego? This is very interesting, because if we analyze the Tilma very carefully, we can clearly see that there is no image of the Virgin. It is as if it were just a few instants before the image was impressed. So, the theory is that the Virgin is looking from in front of the group, invisible. The Morenita appeared to Juan Diego's uncle and healed him, and revealed her name to him, Guadalupe. But Guadalupe was a very well-known name in Spain, in the region of Extremadura. In fact, it is linked to another apparition of the Virgin, which has its roots in the period in which Luke, the evangelist, was writing his gospel. Not having known Jesus personally, St. Luke interrogated all those who'd had the opportunity to listen to him or to meet him, gathering numerous testimonies. The Apostle St. Paul played a fundamental role in the writing of his Gospel. The Evangelist accompanied him on his long journeys from Palestine to Greece, asking him numerous questions about Christ and his teachings. He was present when the Apostle preached to the people. But above all, the Gospel of St. Luke gives the faithful reconstruction of the stories about the true protagonist of this incredible story, Mary. During their long conversations, she confided to him many details of the life of her beloved son, his childhood, the first sermons. St. Luke carefully noted her words, listening devotedly. That is why his work is also called Mary's Gospel. Apart from being an evangelist, it is said that St. Luke was a doctor and an artist. The Virgin was the subject of many paintings and sculptures attributed to him. It is precisely from one of these works that the incredible story that brings us back to the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico begins. It is a little statue portraying the Virgin and Child that was placed beside the body of St. Luke when he died in Thebes. So, how did this artifact from Greece arrive in the Extremadura region of Spain? It is said that the statue was carried from Thebes to Constantinople, together with St. Luke's coffin, on the orders of the Eastern Emperor Constantius in 357 AD. With a grand procession, with a great procession, they brought the coffin of Luke into the church with all the imperial court. At the head of the procession was the Bishop of Constantinople, Macedonius, who held this statue on high while the procession proceeded towards the central altar. It is known that the statue was later given by the Eastern Emperor Maurice to the future Pope Gregory the Great, at the time when he was at the court as the Pope's ambassador. When he returned to Rome, Gregory had two images of the Virgin. One was a painting. The other was a small wooden statue that he took with him to his cell at Celio. Shortly afterwards, in 590 AD, Gregory was elected Pope. 
But the statue by St. Luke did not remain in Rome for long. Gregorio decise di regalarla. Gregory decided to donate it to a friend of his, a very spiritual and intelligent man, Leandro, the Bishop of Seville. The statue remained on the high altar of the cathedral in Seville for about a century, disappearing during the Arab invasion of Spain. Tradition says that the clerics took it in order to take it to safety. They put it in a sack and fled to the west. They took the old Roman road, the Via de Lusitani, which crossed Portugal from north to south. They stopped in Merida for some time and then continued their flight from the invaders, reaching Cáceres in the heart of Extremadura. Following a stream, they came to the edge of a wood and stopped there. They decided that this was a suitable place to hide the precious statue. They began to dig a hole. They pulled out the statue. They looked at it devotedly, knowing that they would never see it again. Then they put it into the sack and buried it. Obviously, nothing more is known of this statue, but traces of it have remained in the popular legends of the area with the people of the area. In fact, they told strange stories, stories that grandparents told the children beside the fire during the winters. They told of a treasure hidden in the woods. For 600 years, the little statue by St. Luke was forgotten until the summer of 1329. Tradition tells that in that year, Gil Cordero, a herdsman from Cáceres, went into the woods to look for a cow that had strayed from his herd. He wandered around for three long days, walking the rough tracks of Extremadura. Hill had lost all hope of finding his cow. He walked along this stream, which was now called Guadalupe, because the Arabs had called it Guadalupe. Finally, in a little clearing, he saw his cow lying on the ground, dead. He went over to the cow to skin it and at least to get some leather and instead the cow stood up. It was alive and kicking. Just at that moment, in a blinding light, appeared the Holy Virgin. Mary asked the man to bring the local priests to the clearing and to tell them to dig in exactly the place where the animal had lain, revealing that they would find a wooden statue of her to be venerated. Distraught, Kiel ran towards the village and the next morning when he arrived home, he told his wife what had happened. His wife, relieved that her husband had returned, told him that their son, who had been seriously ill, was now better. Hill went with his friends to announce the incredible fact to the priests of the village. Together they went to the priests and they told them what the Virgin had said, emphasizing above all the phrase that the Virgin had pronounced, may a small house be built here where the poor who arrive must be given at least one meal a day. The priests went to the place of the apparition, and when they dug, in effect, they found the wooden statue sculpted by St. Luke. Right at that spot, near the Guadeloupe River, the first hermitage was built, which soon became a place of great devotion and residence for the very poor. Subsequently, the King and Queen of Spain, Isabella and Ferdinando, had the habit of visiting this sanctuary. 
addirittura vi costruirono una casa. They even built a house, their residence. E da quel posto And from that place they signed many decrees, many laws. One of these decrees was whether or not to finance the adventure of Christopher Columbus. There are still many proofs of Christopher Columbus's particular devotion to the Virgin of Guadeloupe in Extremadura. A significant episode is reported in his ship's log. Al ritorno dalla scoperta delle Americhe, la nave On his return from discovering the Americas, Christopher Columbus's ship ran into a terrible storm. In this tremendous moment of fear, Columbus gathered the crew and swore that if the Virgin Mary saved them from this terrible storm, some of them should make a pilgrimage to sanctuaries in Europe. Columbus kept his promise. He went to the sanctuary of the Virgin of Guadeloupe in Extremadura. Cortes also came from the region of Extremadura, like many missionaries sent to the New World. This suggests that it was the Spanish who gave the name of Guadeloupe to the Mexican Virgin. Nevertheless, there is proof that the Spanish and even the Franciscan missionaries did not want the Madonna who appeared in Mexico to be called Guadeloupe. On the other hand, at that time, the two peoples were still far from knowing and understanding each other. Following the edict of Charles V, the minister of the Franciscans in Spain, Francisco de los Angeles sent to the Amerindians a group of missionaries known as the Twelve Apostles of Mexico, but they were not able to convert the population. The first years of evangelization were very difficult. The twelve Mexican apostles could not understand the allegorical significance of the statues, which seemed to them monstrous, diabolical. And the Amerindians themselves, above all the priests, could not understand why these men, so holy, who brought a message of peace, who brought a message of brotherhood, were any different from their white Spanish brothers who tortured, imprisoned and killed them. Evidently, a similar evangelization was impossible, titanic. Just think that before 1531 there were 35 Franciscan missionaries, only a few Dominicans and some diocesan, not more than 50 people altogether to evangelize around 23 million natives. What is more, we know that the Spaniards were a terrible example. They killed each other, they stole from each other, and they committed the greatest and most serious injustices. Sumaraga himself was the victim of an attack by the terrible Primera Audiencia, the Spanish government of Mexico, and he wrote to King Charles V telling him of the tragic situation in the colony. This reference to the bishop is very important. For me, it is the key. That is, the Virgin of Guadeloupe came for the Amerindians, who were living the tragedy of the conquest, of the diseases. Their world was collapsing. She also came for the Spaniards, who were destroying each other and who even tried to kill their own bishop. She came to resolve the problems of everyone, not only the native population. She also spoke to the Spaniards of the time and to the half-castes who were being born. Two great peoples united in her, humanly irreconcilable, with different visions, with distinct cosmogonies, a different concept of God, of man, of nature, and yet in Mary we are all united, in Mary we are integrated. The breadth of the message that the Virgin of Guadeloupe incarnated in her image was enormous for Latin America. Guadeloupe arrived to give dignity and protection to all, personifying, with her half-caste features, the birth of a new race, the fruit of union and integration. That is why Guadeloupe has become the symbol of the Mexican population, which was born from that encounter, at first very violent. In her, we can see a sort of futurism. 
because the first half-castes were born in 1521 and the Virgin appeared in 1531. The image of the Morenita is the only example of perfect multiculturalism in history. Because Mary reached both the hearts of the Amerindians, who immediately understood from her image that they could trust her, and of the Spaniards, who recognized her, understanding the dignity of the native peoples that she represented, personifying the symbols of that culture. All this had an incredible impact. The annals of history tell us that after the apparitions, millions of Amerindians were baptized. Not thousands, but millions. The apparition of the Holy Virgin enormously helped the evangelization project, which was facing extreme difficulties. It is clear that an inexplicable external factor helped the mass conversion that took place here, in the center of Mexico. This external factor was the Holy Virgin. We believe in this. The Guadalupe image seems to have what we could call the gift of tongues. That is, it speaks to everyone with their own language, to the scientists in science, to historians in history, to anthropologists in anthropology. And as time passes, we can think that the 16th century apparitions spoke to the Amerindians through this image, which for them was a code. For them, the image was a way of communicating, and in it they saw and read a series of messages, a message of love. And that is how the cloak of a poor Amerindian with exceptional characteristics changed the history of the peoples of Latin America.